Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In today's episode, we're talking about an app that is disrupting the publishing industry and bringing back serialized fiction. If you traveled back in time 100 years and perused your average newsstand, you'd find dozens of magazines that publish serialized fiction. Millions of subscribers eagerly awaited new installments from their favorite authors, and a serialized story in a high circulation magazine could launch a new writer's career. But by the turn of the century, serialized fiction was all but gone. Or at least it was in written in audio form. TV shows, on the other hand, began to adopt complex serialized narratives, and by 2015 these kinds of shows were dominating both online and offline discussion. That's the same year a new app called Serial Box launched. Serial Box operates a lot like a TV studio. Its stories are delivered in weekly installments. Each series is written by a collaborative writer's room. The most successful series will often continue for multiple seasons. There's only one major difference. Instead of producing TV shows, Serial Box publishes text and audio stories that can be read or listened to in the same way you consume a novel. I recently interviewed co-founder Molly Barton about Serial Box's origin story, how the company produces new series, and why she's pursuing adaptations outside of the Serial Box app. Before we jump into the interview, I want to talk a little bit about my Substack newsletter. It's not one of those newsletters where I simply curate industry news. I publish regular deep dives into the business of media. It's vital reading for all those who want to grow their newsletters, podcasts, video channels, and news sites. To subscribe, go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com, or just Google the word Simon Owens in newsletter. Okay, now on to my interview with Molly. Hey, Molly, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Simon. So you're the co-founder and CEO of an app called Serial Box. Uh, One of the interesting quirks about the company's founding story is that you and your co-founder had the exact same idea for the company before you even knew each other, right? Tell me about that. That's right. Um, I prior to co-founding Serial Box, I was global digital director at Penguin Random House, and I had started my career in in book publishing as an editor. I worked with writers like Nick Hornby and Terry McMillan. I was really interested in fiction that reaches you know, millions and millions of people and stories that travel well across media formats um, from an er- early point in my career. And so uh, through my time at Penguin, I had gotten into this more um, business strategy job focused on ebook and audiobook growth and format exploration. Um, so I had developed a pretty clear hunch that you know, people's behavior was changing with uh, smartphones and not just attention spans per se, but expectations um, that content should be delivered uh, flexibly, be very appropriate for mobile um, devices. And I was watching the rise of, you know, television um, in terms of cultural influence and podcasts in terms of consumption and felt like that session-based experience is so fantastic for people, the ability to dip into an episode and try it. And if you like it and you have more time or you can bear to stay awake longer, you can say, next, I want another one. Uh, So I was really interested in that, the sort of putting the agency back in the reader or listener's hand um, rather than dumping a huge digital file on them um, all at once. And so I experimented with, with serialization while I was at Penguin Random House. We ran some experiments. Um, and serialization had been all but dead at this point because it used to be huge with, you know, the era of Charles Dickens magazines would, you know, publish regular chapters in a serial over a period of weeks or months. The pulp magazines, genre pulp magazines used to do it. But by, you know, the 2000s serialization in terms of like writing was pretty much gone. Right. Few and far between. Right. Like, um, Stephen King experimented a little bit, um, Tom Wolfe with Bonfire of the Vanities, but that was back in the 90s, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, right, you're right, that relationship between magazines and newspapers running bits of story that would then make them their way into book format uh, had really receded. So I was interested in reawakening that connection and delivering content in a way that made it really easy for people to dip in. So we we created this experiment where we took um, 
a few writers who were really interested in dig digital experimentation and asked them to write novels that were structured to be read a couple chapters at a time and then release those week by week. Um, those experiments were really successful and kind of confirmed my hunch. Um, so that along with you know great interest in audio led me to co-found Serial Box. And so while I was starting the company, I um, was talking to different colleagues in the business and Evan Ratliff at the Atavist um, introduced me to Julian Yap, who would end up uh, becoming my co-founder. And Julian, not from the publishing world at all, was experiencing the, the sort of trend uh, that I was noticing from the publisher side as a consumer. So he uh, was a huge reader and listener um, of content. And when he found himself working for the Obama administration in a huge job where he was responsible for um, some gun control policy after the Han Sandy Hook shooting, um, he didn't feel like he could make time for reading. He felt all that work pressure, uh, but still found himself, you know, catching an episode of a show, sneaking in a comic book here and there. And he kept thinking if someone would just deliver book content to me the way that they deliver TV, I could get over that psychological hump. Um, and so we really shared the same view um, of, you know, where where audio and ebook content should go in terms of uh, not just delivery, but creation. We work with teams of writers in many cases, as opposed to individual writers. Um, so we co-founded the company in 2015 and began to develop our first few projects. Uh, and we raised first capital um, in the fall of 2017. And uh, and he, even though he had a very successful career as a lawyer, he didn't have a background in publishing. What made you think that he would make a good partner for this? Julian is one of the best read, most uh, knowledgeable sort of consumers of pop culture and um, comic books and, and written entertainment that I've ever encountered. Um, and even though he was working on this great um, legal career, uh, he has an incredible network of relationships with science fiction and fantasy writers. Um, so he, ironically, um, many of his close contacts were some of our earliest collaborators. And how did you make the app a reality? Because it sounds like you didn't have a lot of money to start with. Was it like completely bootstrapped? And how did you get those first projects off the ground? Yeah, both Julian and I... Um, uh, we're really committed to to making this happen. And so we spent that first couple of years with a little bit of support from family and friends, but foregoing any salary of any kind um, and just working on developing um, the first few series. Um, so we, by the time we went to external investors, uh, we'd developed and released five series. Uh, you know, we paid the writers relatively modest um, sums of money and uh, shared royalties with them on those projects. Uh, and it wasn't until we could see that people were coming back to buy a second title from us that we went out to raise money because we felt like we uh, had really built something that people wanted more of. And how did you source those, or those early projects? Like in your early days, you focused mainly on genre fiction, right? Yes. Um, we're really interested in speculative storytelling. Um, that is a big focus of the company uh, today. So it's science fiction, fantasy, some mystery, some horror, some thriller, um, but really, you know, stories that allow you to tweak some element of reality and explore that um, through a compelling narrative. Um, the writers that we worked with earliest on were um, writers that we really admired and um, either knew personally or were able to get to through um, other people that we knew. So Max Gladstone um, was one of the first writers that we worked with. And then Alan Kushner um, was somebody that Julian uh, had known through uh, his schooling. So we reached out to her and she was really excited at the idea of developing a prequel to her famous Riverside trilogy. 
And you've talked a lot about how the writer setup resembles the writing room for a TV show. Can you talk about that dynamic and and what you mean by that? Yes. Um, We develop, for many projects, we work with more than one writer. So we bring together somewhere between two to five writers um, who have complementary skills. And we... um, employ one of them as the lead writer, who you could say is almost like the showrunner, though they don't have all the business responsibility that a showrunner does. Um, they're the um, the person who's reading uh, more actively across early drafts by the other writers. And we bring them together. It used to be in person. Now it's lots of Zoom um, for a story summit where we flesh out the season working from, you know, approved materials that, that we've collaborated on before that gathering. Um, and what we love about the, the writer's room format is that you commit to the story world, uh, of a given series, and then you're able to talk through, um, how that's going to make its way into an audio series um, and what the best experience for a listener is going to be. So it, in some ways, um, it draws on the strengths of uh, each of the, the writers in the room and you get um, the, the most out of the collective um, possible. You know, you might have someone in the room who's much stronger with uh, plotting somebody who's really excellent at dialogue. Um, it reminds me a little bit of of how FX is working with their writers' rooms. You know, I've, they've told me that on occasion they'll bring in a poet for three days to work with the um, screenwriters on the TV writers, excuse me, on sense of place. You know, and so they're really thoughtful about the different um, textures needed to deliver a really excellent story, and and we're working. Uh, in an adapted version of that tradition. And does it speed up the process by having multiple writers? Um, yes and no. Um, it depends on the, the assembling the group and just the feasibility of schedules can be more complicated when you have more people involved. Um, but once you get into the actual writing, it usually does um, speed up the process and especially if you're lucky enough to gain a broad enough listenership readership to green light a second season. Um, that second season is really um, a joy because uh, the writers already have a shorthand with each other and they can move really uh, swiftly. And it like works where once they get into the, they get into the room, they create a show Bible, they come out with like the rough sketches of the world and the plot and stuff like that. And then each writer is like assigned a different episode, quote unquote episode of the serial. Cause you don't call them chapters, right? You call them episodes. We call them episodes. And typically there are eight or 10 episodes in a given series, each one being about uh, 20, 25 minutes of listening uh, and shorter for, for reading. Um, so yes, that's exactly right. They, they would have gone into the um, gathering with, an approved pilot um, already written and a Bible. And so they're fleshing it out from there. And how do you, how do you sort or like, how do you develop new projects? Like do, does a showrunner come in and just pitch you on it? And then he assemble he or she uh, assembles a team or, you know, like what's the, what's the kind of process of, of you picking new projects? Um. A variety of different ways. Um, our content team is uh, regularly producing concepts that they're interested in based on what's happening in the world um, and doing some of that early um, thought process around you know, stories that we want to pursue. And then we'll bring in writers to help develop that early idea. Um, we also take um, pitches from the, you know, more than 200 best-selling and award-winning writers that we work with, um, and occasionally from agents who who bring us uh, concepts that they think might work for us uh, along with their clients. And how are these serials packaged on the app itself? Like when someone is opening the app, um, how, do, how do people purchase them and how do people consume them? So um, Serial Box is 
to be clear, an audio storytelling studio as well as a platform. So we have the website and we have our Android and iOS apps. Um, in some cases, we also distribute content onto third party platforms, whether that's in the form of a podcast or an ebook and audiobook channels. Um, but the Serial Box experience, uh, you come into the platform, typically that's on the app. Um, that we actually do get a fair amount of usage on our on our website as well, uh, which is fully functional and actually has some features that we haven't rolled out yet in the app. Um, so we sell the series by episode or by season. Um, so you can read the first or listen to the first episode in every series for free. Uh, and then if you like it, you can go ahead and, and purchase it. And like, and so you you don't release all the episodes at once in a season. Do you re release it on like some kind of weekly basis or something like that? Yeah, typically we drop a few episodes uh, the first day that a season is releasing, and then we follow up week after week with new episodes. And within the app or the website, they they can they can toggle back and forth between reading and listening to it. Yes, and on the website, you can do um, listening and reading simultaneously in a flow reader experience, which is really wonderful. I love audio. Um, I've been a huge proponent of audio books um, for a long time, um, but and I listen to plenty of podcasts, including yours, um, but I am a really visual person. So I love to have um, closed captioning on if I'm watching a video on YouTube and similarly on Serial Box, you know, whenever possible, we offer the text as a secondary format um, so that, you know, if you get distracted for a moment or your mind drifts, you can refer to the words and, and get caught up with what you're hearing. And doesn't that create a dynamic where someone could be reading on the couch, but then like they then need to go drive somewhere so they just can toggle back and forth. So they're, they're reading and then they're listening to it a few minutes later. Have you seen data that suggests that people are doing that? Yes, definitely. That format switching occurs and we want the content to be as flexible as possible, whether you're walking your dog or you've got your phone propped up on the windowsill while you're doing your dishes. Uh, we want you to be able to keep listening mm -hmm. or reading. And and how do you think about pricing and purchasing? Like you don't do subscript. This seems like it seems to me, and I'm sure that tons of people have said this. It seems like this this could be a subscription play. This could be the Netflix for you know ebooks slash audiobooks. Uh, but you don't do subscriptions, right? Like they have to purchase either on a per episode basis or a whole season. That's right. We've been focused on the a la carte model, sort of pay as you go. Um, we have increasingly heard from our listeners and readers that they'd be interested uh, in subscription access. So it's something that we're talking about actively. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, it's just not something that you're ready to roll out yet. And uh, and how do you market your serials? Like, wh like, what role do the authors play? In because you get like some pretty big authors now, right? That have their own kind of fan bases and brands. And I imagine by having several of them on the same serial, you can kind of bring their fan bases together. What talk about about the marketing and how you roll out a new serial? Sure, um, we have you know two different elements of the marketing um, that we do. There's the platform marketing of getting people to be aware of Serial Box as, you know, your portal to another world and a great place uh, to discover um, some pretty amazing um, speculative stories. Um, and so there we do, you know, everything from podcast ads, social ads, radio, uh, out of home, uh, partnerships, email marketing, you know, push notifications, all of the things that come along with with uh, running a D2C platform. And then with the shows in particular, um, we do sort of everything you'd expect, national media campaigns, outreach to um, listeners of similar titles, um, some title specific partnerships, um, and lots of community engagement uh, on social and elsewhere. You know, we have a really engaged following. We've been quite focused on the uh, the quality of our engagement rather than the size of our following. And so we're really happy to see um, the level of engagement, particularly through COVID uh, with our fans on Instagram and Twitter in particular, um, just be really um, 
just they're you know reacting to every post they're talking to us all the time um and so we're able to share uh, news of new series there in a pretty effective way in partnership with talent um so we've done a whole bunch with instagram lives uh, through COVID, we've just rolled out a new series called Serial Box Party, where you can um, you can listen to a series and be chatting with your friends in the same uh, browser window. Uh, and then we've also been really successful with a promotional program called Serial of the Week, uh, where we give uh, limited time free access to a particular series that we're focused on. Yeah, I think I remember reading or interviewing one of your writers a few years ago for an article, and maybe it was your writer or maybe it was you or your co-founder, where the person said, we realized that the that this was taken off and we started getting tagged in like posts of with like fan art and stuff like that from characters from our serials. Yes, yeah, we've seen some fan art. Um, we've seen some cosplaying of characters from the series, which is pretty awesome. Um, so we're really focused on um, the community uh, around the writers that we work with and, you know, making sure they have early access and um, sort of know what's up with the writers that they love. And you, you, because we're talking in TV lingo, you, you don't, you renew seasons, right? Like whenever there's a, a, a sequel, it's the second season. Like that's how right. you phrase it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, what about traditional PR? Like it, obviously, there's a huge book reviewing apparatus set up uh, that you know reviews books and stuff. You know, everywhere from Publishers Weekly to you know tons of review sites and stuff like that. How easy, g- given that you have a slightly different format, how easy has it been to engage that particular community? Yeah, we've um, been nominated for Hugo's and other awards in the categories that are most important to us. Um, so the, that publishing community certainly recognizes what we're doing. We have adjusted some of our production schedules recently to um, make the content more easily accessible to that traditional reviewing cycle. Um, but we certainly work on national media campaigns. We just um, had an exclusive in The Hollywood Reporter um, on Thursday for our Black Panther series, announcing that um, William Jackson Harper is narrating it. So so traditional PR is, is definitely part of what we do. And, you know, with TV, they'll do things like package, like a H- new HBO show will package several episodes together before they've even come out and send it to a reviewer. Do you kind of work like that at all? Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned the Black Panther thing. You have some interesting strategy around IP, both in terms of bringing outside IP into the app, but then also trying to sell your IP outside of the app. So like stories that you're creating on the app, then trying to get it adapted into other for- formats. First, can you talk a little bit, a bit about your efforts to get TV and film adaptation, adaptations of your serials, like the ones that are sourced on your app? Sure. Um, we've been really uh excited about the interest from the film and TV world and what we're doing. Um, We haven't spent a huge amount of time or energy pitching um, content to um, colleagues in those industries, but we've gotten a lot of inbound interest and we have a number of projects in development for film and television um, with some really uh, great company. So, so very excited to share more when we have um, dates. Obviously, that an industry has been challenged um, with COVID, but there's plenty of script writing going on. And I've seen um, some great scripts based on Serial Box Originals um, over the last couple of months. So there's a lot of activity there. Um, but our primary focus as a business is on, you know, audio storytelling and making sure that um, we're growing our listenership and our readership on the platform. Mm-hmm. And you keep on using that word audio storytelling. Do you feel like your audio first and text second? Um, well, in success, you know, the company would probably evolve into two different divisions, you know, the way that Netflix has a division that's entirely devoted to content creation and then entirely devoted to platform um, development and subscription management. No, uh, sorry, right. sorry, I said audio and text, T-E-X-T. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so audio um, is definitely the dominant format um, by far. Um, we used to have the platform set up so that 
you could open an episode and see the text and then click into the audio from there. Um, about a year and a half ago, we switched to present the formats with equal weight. So you could click into the listening or the reading. Um, and we've just seen overwhelmingly that that listening is, is the preferred format. Um, so that's our main focus. And when we're producing, this was true from the beginning, when we're producing original stories, um, we work really closely with our audio production team, uh, you know, from the conception of the story uh, through development. So unlike in traditional publishing where, you know, the audio book um, recording is kind of entirely separate from the production of the physical book and the ebook. Uh, we're anticipating the audio experience from day one. Mm -hmm. And then you're forming partnerships with like major studios and other IP holders to bring their content into your app. Uh, you, you mentioned Black Panther. I seem to, I saw something about uh uh, a DC partnership. I think you're also doing working with maybe some news organizations or like some something involved with nonfiction. Tell me about that kind of part of the process. Sure. Um, we have released a few series um, that are based around characters we licensed from Marvel. We were really excited uh, when we were quite a young company that they were willing to entrust us with those characters who are so beloved. Uh, but they understood the serialized storytelling model because it's so familiar to them with with comics. And so the idea of having serialized ebook and audiobook. Um, uh, new stories around uh, Marvel characters was interesting to them. Um, we also work on extending um, storylines that are no longer on TV. Uh, so Orphan Black was a really beloved show, maybe one of the most dedicated fan bases uh, in recent history of a TV show. And so it went for five years. It had a very concrete ending, but there was still palpable longing from that audience for more. Um, so we partnered with the IP holder and brought in the star of the show, um, Emmy Award winning Tatiana Maslany, to um, jump forward in time and um, tell a new story with some of those characters um, from the TV series. And that, that's been really successful for us um, as a strategy because we're tapping into existing fan bases who are hungry for high quality new storytelling with the characters that they love. That's really interesting. And so when we think about like success of books or audiobooks, we think of the traditional New York Times bestseller. Can you give me a sense of like where the popularity slash financial success of a really successful serial on serial box does compared to, you know, like a best selling book? Like is it are is it that kind of is that is it that kind of success? Like give me a sense of you know how big you guys are getting. Yeah, so I mean, bestsellers, um, best-selling books, the number of of titles that or number of copies you have to sell to make it onto the bestseller list um, swings pretty wildly. You might know, um, mm -hmm. depending on the time of year and what what other titles are available. Um, but I'm I'm pretty familiar with those levels, and we're. Um, reaching uh, that level of audience with some of our series. Um, so it's early days yet. Uh, you know, we, as I said, we took first financing in, in 2017, so it's been a little under three years. Um, but we are uh, really excited about the growth that we're seeing and remembering that, you know, the, the book business, um, is monetizing across physical ebook and audiobook and and we don't have that physical piece as a core component and it's still a significant part of the book business. And that's what's amazing about you is that you could have just been like okay we're just going to focus on the content and then we'll just distribute the stuff on Audible and as ebooks on Amazon but you decided to build your own tech stack uh and like build basically in a community from scratch. Right. We felt strongly that um, book content um, had not truly been optimized for mobile. Um, and so we really wanted to control um, the experience and innovate on the experience. Uh, we also felt really strongly that we wanted to be able to offer the reading and listening experience together in one platform for one price. 
but you also have repackaged some of your seals, right, as actual books that can be sold in bookstores, Amazon, and on Audible, right? Yes, some of the um, big five publishers have approached us um, about acquiring print rights um, to our works, and so in a few cases, we've we've done those deals and have you know uh, physical editions out in the market, which is great. And what's the advantage of that? It's just like one other way that people can access your content. Sure, I mean, I recognize um, that you know different. Uh, contexts require different presentation of content and some people still really love to have the physical book. Um, so when we find a publisher um, who has the right approach to marketing and distributing physical books, then we're, we're excited to partner with them. Yeah. That's why I find your company so interesting because there's just so many ways to, that you're pulling IP into the platform and then also pushing IP outside of the platform and repackaging and doing all kinds of um, you know, interesting stuff. Like I'm sure even your Marvel stuff could then be repackaged as an actual comic book that exists outside and, and different stuff like that. So uh, it's really interested, interesting how many different ways you can kind of uh, cut up your content and, and generate new customers through it, I feel like. Yeah, we've also, to that end, we've actually sold um, translation rights to... Um, I think over 20 to in 20 different countries um, to our works. So we definitely want it to be widely available in as many formats as possible. And I think the last time I talked to you guys a few months, few years ago, you hadn't really been doing much in podcasts, but it seems like there's a, there is at least some kind of opportunity there to take these chapters and make them episodes. Have you, have you been dabbling in that at all? Yes, we've distributed a few shows in podcast channels. Um, and, you know, I'm well aware that in, uh, in Germany and in China, other parts of Asia, ebooks, audiobooks, and podcasts are all distributed in the same platform. Um, so that's something we're really mindful of. Um, and we have seen some good early success in podcast channels and are, um, exploring, you know, new opportunities there given um, the new focus on scripted podcasting. So I, as I'm sure you know, and, and maybe other guests of yours have talked about, um, audiobooks are a really rapidly growing um, segment. And um, over 70% of revenue in, in audiobooks, as I understand it, is from fiction titles. Um, whereas in the podcasting space, you know, less than 5% of podcasts are scripted. Um, and so we think that sort of business model deterrent of um, advertisers not being up for sponsoring scripted shows is creating some artificial and um, limitations on what's available. So we're really interested to explore um, windows of distribution in those channels. And are you writing like actual teleplays or is it mainly just taking the audio files and repackaging them as episodes? Um, our audio format, if you've listened to Serial Box Originals and the exclusives that we have with Marvel and other partners, um, are... Um, typically single narrator. In some cases, we have multiple narrators, but we have a rich soundscape, original music, and sound effects throughout. So it's a much more immersive listening experience than a typical audiobook. Um, we've also done, you know, full radio plays. Our, a couple of our team members um, have been involved with many radio plays. Um, and so... Uh, it, it really just depends on the, the project and the budget and the distribution plan. And are you monetizing that through advertising or are you like releasing an earlier season to promote an upcoming season? Like how are you approaching that from a business perspective? Uh, we've done both. It really depends on the, the project and the distribution strategy for that, um, that title or that show. Um, but we've seen success with that strategy you reference of releasing uh, an earlier season um, to, to grow the listenership uh, in advance of a, a second season. Mm -hmm. Like it, you can actually bring new new listeners, readers into the fold because they can they can sample it for free. That's right. 
And Netflix and a few other big platforms have experimented with creating kind of podcasts that are, I think, mainly unscripted, you know, interviewing the people behind the scenes of their shows and giving fan bases an extra outlet to go to to listen to additional content. Have you experimented with that at all? We have not. Um, there's certainly a lot of conversation about um, shows um, like Orphan Black uh, on our social channels just because people are obsessed with the characters and the franchise. And um, so so we see that kind of conversation happening between fans um, and in some cases are participating in it. Um, but we are really focused on scripted. Mm -hmm. Okay, Molly, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? Uh, in the app stores, uh, look for Serial Box. That's S-E-R-I-A-L Box or SerialBox.com. Okay, well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Okay, thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.